it's a real pleasure to be um, speaking at this Ember BI webinar today. And um, great to be talking to what I guess is probably quite a, a wide international um, audience. Uh, so yes, I'm Bill Baker. I'm um, a plant taxonomist at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. I've worked here for more than more than two decades. Um, but the current decade that I'm in is characterized by quite a lot of intense work on big picture um, work on the plant tree of life. And that's what the seminar is about today. Um, but before I go any further, um, I would like to say a, a huge thank you to the whole team that uh, has been in the past and, has, and is still involved in this project. I think I have something like 38 faces on this screen of current um, project team members and, and our alumni. Um, uh, you'll see the acronym PAFTOL. This stands for the Plant and Fungal Trees of Life. And I'll be telling you about the plant component uh, of this broad agenda that we run here at Kew. So um, the idea of the tree of life has been used as a, as a metaphor in a whole range of ways for, for millennia. Um, I'm starting here with just one of the many sort of spiritual, mythic, um, religious uses of the idea of the tree of life. This is Yggdrasil, uh, uh, a tree of life concept embedded in, in Norse myth. Um, as an expert on, on the palm family, I'm very used to referring to my favorite organismal group as the tree of life, um, because it's so important to people. Um, uh, six of the top 10 commonest palm trees uh, in the Amazon are, are palms and people depend, depend on them. We all depend on them because of the way um, they impact rainforest functioning and indeed global earth system processes. But the coconut palm, for example, is also called the tree of life. Here's a rather grim image on the right of a man surviving on, on water um, from a coconut in the aftermath of the Boxing Day tsunami, um, where often coconut water was the only way people could stay hydrated with, with, uh, with clean water. But of course, today we're really talking about the tree of life of, uh, as a system of organization among um, organisms. And we tend to think of the tree of life as a depiction of, of evolutionary processes, but it's important to understand that um, the tree of life has existed as, a, a, as an organismal idea, even for, for in, in a pre-evolutionary context and in, and, and in the context of people who, who, who rejected evolution. Um, the paleontological charts of Hitchcock, um, for example, depict, I guess, what you might call more sort of um, bushes of life, um, but certainly branching diagrams somehow representing the organization of both plants um, and animals in some progressive way. I'm quite a fan of these because at the top of the plant tree, juxtaposed against man at the top of the animal tree, we, we have plants. Um, so I often use this, this image to big up my, my own thing. Um, this is, of course, though, uh, I guess why we're all here, we're interested in in the evolutionary tree of life. This is arguably the most famous tree of life depiction out there um, from the famous notebook B of Charles Darwin that was uh, recently stolen and returned to the, to the library at Cambridge University. Um, Darwin would be amazed uh, to see uh, the point that we're at now um, with really comprehensive trees across uh, the whole of, uh, of life. Um, and um, he would also be delighted to see how the tree of life has gained real recognition as the fundamental biological roadmap through which we navigate the diversity of life on Earth. And I often say to people, well, for, for in, in the life sciences, the tree of life is in a sense equivalent to the periodic table for the physical sciences in the way that it allows us to predict and navigate the properties of life. Um, so what's this got to do with Q? Um, I guess many of you may not even realize that we have a major science program at Q with some 400 odd staff in our science directorate. Um, and the tree of life has been right at the center of our, of our research program for decades now. Um, of course, if one wants to discover the tree of life, ideally would, one would, would, would find it written in the rocks in the fossil record showing a neat connection between 
um, between fossils and different geological strata. But the reality is that the fossil record is, is incomplete. So where do we look for our evidence to reconstruct the tree of life? We look to DNA because, of course, to use a, a, a bit of a cliche here, the, 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 the changes in DNA are, that accumulate over time are, in a sense, a molecular fossil record. And Q was really um, at the vanguard of applying um, DNA sequence data to uh, understanding the relationships among plants, particularly the flowering plants. Um, there was, in particular, a major benchmark publication, super highly cited paper published in 1993, focused on the tree of life as inferred from, from, from a single plastid genome encoded gene, uh, RBCL, um, photosynthesis, photosynthetic enzyme gene. Um, and this led on to the application of the tree of life in, in the classification of plants. And classification sits uh, right in the center of what Q science is all about. It's really our bread and butter, classifying, documenting um, and global plant diversity. And of course, classification, especially at the high level, is central to, um, to, to, to the way we are able to communicate about, uh, about plant diversity. So the so-called angiosperm phylogeny group classification is now deeply embedded um, across the systematic botany community, but also far beyond, the two, you know, particularly important to, to users who want to use names for plant families, for plant orders um, that reflect uh, true evolutionary relationships. <clears throat> but it's not just about, about uh, taxonomy. Um, the tree of life has many applications, and I, I have just a couple of examples from my own colleagues, um, not my own work, but a couple of examples, one from fungi, one from plants. Um, so uh, my colleague uh, Bryn Dentinger, who's a mycologist, um, is an expert on the porcini mushrooms, the bolites. Um, he obtained a packet of dried porcini mushrooms from a Chinese supermarket and was rather intrigued by this. And so rather than cook them up, uh, he chose to sequence them. And he sequenced them, and then by integrating them within uh, the sequences within uh, his existing tree of life for, for the porcini mushrooms, he discovered three undescribed species uh, in this packet being sold in a supermarket, which is kind of funny until you start to consider that we don't know what the properties of those uh, mushrooms are, and indeed, mushrooms are known to sometimes be toxic, and so there's a public health concern that the tree of life was able to illuminate. Um, the second example on the right-hand side of the slide pertains to the um, very well-known work of my colleague Felix Forrest, um, who explored phylogenetic diversity across the landscape um, in Southern Africa, and used this to identify that um, while we recognize that certain parts of the Cape Peninsula are super highly diverse um, for basic species richness, if one wants to capture um, high phylogenetic diversity um, uh, across the landscape, in fact, there are other parts of the Cape region that are every bit as important as the Cape Peninsula. So this was a benchmark study in demonstrating how the tree of life can be invaluable to the um, to, to conservation prioritization. So it's all about making sense of life on Earth, and that's a non-trivial thing when you're talking about plants. There are some 380,000 species of land plants, most of which are the flowering plants. And this really begs the question, after decades of work, you know, how are we doing? How well do we know the plant tree of life? Well, I'll give you two um, ends of the spectrum, I suppose. Um, we have some really, really big trees. This is the classic Smith and Brown tree of 2018, which is a, syn a synthetic tree, a tree that's pulled together um, all available data from a set of widely sequenced genes from the long, long legacy of Sanger sequencing that um, spans the history, a recent history of systematic botany in particular. And all of these sequences have been pulled together um, and an enormous synthetic tree with, with over 350,000 tips covering all the vascular plants in this case uh, are included. 
but you'll see many blue tips in that tree and those blue tips represent branches for which there were in fact no public DNA data and, and those tips were in fact interpolated in using taxonomic um, surrogates. So that in fact shows quite how patchy um, the, the broad public resource um, of, of, of DNA sequence data for plants is. And totally at the other end of the spectrum, there's this remarkable piece of work from the um, 1000 Plants Initiative, also known by its um, acronym 1KP. I published a, a major nature paper in 2019. Um, this project focused on generating transcriptomes and um, they generated nearly 1200 uh, transcriptomes across the whole of the green plants and were able to boil out of that uh, around um, 400 single copy gene families that um, in which orthology was sufficiently credible that they could infer um, this particular tree of life. It's, it's unrooted, which it has this sort of sea dragon um, look to it. So you have uh, there, you know, the other end of the spectrum, this is a really, really big data uh, tree, but the sampling compared to the Smith and Brown tree is, is, is a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, so where are we heading um, right now? Well, I guess the most um, famous project at the moment is the Earth Biogenome Project, and sitting within that, the UK's own Darwin Tree of Life project. Both of these projects are all about sequencing all life. They're visionary moon projects, really impactful, where the aspiration is, in short, to generate gold standard whole genomes um, for every living thing on the planet. It's a great idea. However, there are severe limitations, quite apart from the cost. Um, how do you achieve taxonomic scale if you want to do long read sequencing, um, which is, uh, I guess, the central um, technology applied in, 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 in these projects? You need really fantastic DNA. How are you going to lay your hands on high quality, high molecular weight DNA from material around the world. Um, so achieving taxonomic scale and sourcing those samples and the top quality DNA is a major, um, a major limiting factor um, before you even get to the generation of the data and the assembling of, of, of the genomes themselves. And so the question is, well, if, if you do want to achieve scale, you know, where are you going to look? Um, and as uh, a long-standing staff member of a, a, an institution that is a collections-based institution, meaning that all of our science grows from an astonishing set of biological assets that we are obliged to um, take curate and take care of under the National Heritage Act. Um, as, as a collections-based institution, how can we look to our historical collections to um, derive uh, new material, new 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 data types such as genomic data, um, and I'm showing you here just a collage of images of of specimens from our um, our herbarium. I don't assume that you all know what a, a an herbarium is. It's um, you can all picture, I guess, um, the way in a natural history museum butterflies or insects might be pinned out and kept in drawers, each one representing a unique occurrence of that particular organism on the place of on the, on the face of the planet at a given time. Well, there is an equivalent method for doing that for plants. Um, it's rather simple. You collect material in, in the field, you press it, you dry it, you stick it or um, tag it onto, onto large sheets of sheets of card and lay them away in a systematic sequence. And we have 7 million of these um, dating back to the 1800s and, and even a bit earlier in some instances. And the really exciting thing is that, you know, we have this enormous representation of, um, of plant life on Earth in, in this uh, herbarium, but uh, first generation um, DNA sequencing methods, particularly the Sanger method, have been relatively inefficient for securing DNA data from old samples. However, as we have transitioned into a, a, an area of high throughput sequencing, um, we find that we can at last really unlock the treasure chest, as 
um, one, one of these uh, many of these many articles that's been stressing this point um, states um, the DNA that one can extract from specimens like this is of course um, very degraded. Uh, but is in you know because it's degraded, it's actually highly suitable for short read sequencing. So uh, the advent and the decreasing cost of, of short read sequencing is really opening up opportunities for for us to tuck into the herbarium and and, and put it to a, a use that um, the founders of our herbarium in in in, in the mid eighteen hundreds could never have have imagined. All these ideas were very much on our mind as we started to chart a new strategic course around 2014, 2015. And over two science strategic phases, um, we have really put an emphasis on rebooting our tree of, tree of life research by founding the Pathtol project, by refining it in um, our current tree of life initiative, which I lead which has a very simple aim, which is to expand and populate the tree of life of plants and fungi. And there are three deliverables. Um, the first one is the, the headline, I guess. We want to complete the tree of life at the genus level. So uh, that basically means um, sampling one species for every genus, the taxonomic category above the species level of both flowering plants and fungi. Um, so for flowering plants, that number is around 13 and a half thousand. For fungi, the number is about 8,000, but um, fungal taxonomy is such a black box that that number could be almost anything, but that's that's the number we have to work with right now. So completing the tree for, for those two groups is, is, is what this initiative is really all about. And then on top of that, um, we want to dynamically and digitally disseminate the tree and the data in as open a way as possible. And we want to apply the tree across, um, across Q-Science. So when we kicked off with this in uh, 2015, we were funded in around 2016. Um, the first thing we had to decide was how would we go about this methodologically knowing we're constrained to short read sequencing, what kind of approach would we take? And it quickly emerged um, once we started you know, measuring the temperature on the, on the trends in the plant systematic community that target sequence capture would be the method of choice. If you're unfamiliar with this method, I recommend this short paper in uh, Trends in Plant Sciences led by Stephen Dodsworth, um, which gives a nice outline of this very cute technique. Um, it's a reduced representation method that um, uses uh, RNA, usually RNA probes, to pull out a defined set of target regions. Um, and it has a nifty um, method of, of using biotinylated baits, probes, um, in concert with streptavidin coated magnetic beads that mean you can you can enrich uh, a genomic library for your 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 given set of genes so we opted for that it became very obvious to, to us that that was what we would what we would need to do that would fit in both in terms of what we were able to do with the kinds of dna we work with and uh, would fit in with us on, on on a kind of cost basis the challenge here, however, is that as target sequence capture was growing as a, as a popular method, every individual research group, um, when they defined whatever their target group would be, was going off developing a transcriptome or some genomic resource from which they would then boil out their own unique set of target genes. Um, and so, you know, for example, very early on, the people who work on the Daisy family established um, a, a, a kit for the Asteraceae. My own community went off and established two distinct kits on, on, on palms, similarly in the legume family. So the big challenge is, well, if we want to build a huge tree, how would we bring those data together if they're all different genes? Um, and looking back to the amazing work I mentioned earlier, the paper published by Mark Chase et al. in 1993. This 
paper was a huge success and was so influential because it drew on the fact that everybody was sequencing the same things. In those days, they were constrained by what they could practically get access to because there were PCR primers and so on. Um, so we were immediately thinking, well, how can we try to sequence common loci so that not only can we pull together um, a, a big tree of life for the flowering plants, but how can we ensure that our data will be valuable and, and usable into the future? Um, so we set about creating a universal probe set, um, which ended up being called Angiosperms 353, which will um, become obvious in a moment. And we, we had a sort of set of uh, requirements. Um, we wanted it to be a standardized set that would work um, universally across all angiosperms, regardless of the family they belong to. We also had a slightly crazy optimistic idea that we could design it such that it would be effective across taxonomic scale. So it would be uh, the variability among the genes that we would identify would, would be informative whether we were tackling very high level questions, relationships among the families, or indeed fine scale relationships among species, or maybe even lower. And really importantly, we wanted to make everything that we did openly available to all. Target sequence capture, especially at that time, um, was still relatively inaccessible because you had to have the resources to, you had to have genomic resources, or you had to have the funding to generate the genomic resources. You had to have the skills and the capacity, the bioinformatics skills and capacity to, um, to, uh, to, to, to design a probe set and then ongoing funding to be able to afford to, uh, to, to buy, buy the probes themselves. So we really wanted to help. We wanted to create something that was open and that people, people would get behind the idea. So we teamed up with a fantastic set of collaborators um, at the Chicago Botanic Garden in particular. Um, so that's Norm Wickett and Matt Johnson. Matt is now at Texas Tech University. Um, and we also had support from Arbor Biosciences, now Arbor Daisel, uh, who a provider who um, supports um, this kind of methods uh, in, in our community quite extensively. And we were able to draw on the thousand plants, the one, one KP um, project I mentioned earlier, who had generated this amazing data set of, uh, of, of low or single copy genes um, for, uh, yeah, for, for, for many, many angiosperms. So that was the, the design data set. Um, and we looked at the 410 single copy genes that they identified and boiled them down to a set of, guess what, 353 uh, low copy loci. And through a rather neat statistical approach, um, managed to uh, select the minimum number of instances of each of those genes from the design data set that would likely uh, would be within sufficient distance from any, uh, any flowering plant family that we would likely get good recovery. And indeed, we did in that um, in the in the paper here um, published in Systematic Biology, and actually in twenty nineteen, um, we we gave evidence that we could, you know, the median recovery was around one hundred and thirty seven kb out of a um, of a total of around two hundred and sixty. But that you also, in, in addition to the exons that you're targeting, you also get intronic data in what we call the splash zone, the the bits around the edges that often get dragged dragged through with the, the target enrichment. Anyway, I encourage you to go and take a, a look at this um, at this paper if you're interested in the design details, which weren't led by me, but um, it's a very nice piece of work. Uh, we then just got stuck in and we started cranking through uh, samples here in Q. And this is a, just a crude plot of um, uh, each dot represent, representing one sample. Uh, with the number of genes that we recovered against the total length of those genes for each sample. Um, and we found that we were pushing up the median recovery into sort of 160 KB, right? These are patchy data sets. When you look at a heat map of recovery, it looks like a, you know, a tapestry of colors, um, but 160 KB is still a lot of data. Um, and it turns out to be rather effective at, at doing its job. So 
we are, I'll talk a bit more about this particular tree later on in the talk, but we are already building very accurate um, and very, very large trees of some 10,000 tips um, using data we've generated uh, using that toolkit. Um, but I guess the question that the community wanted to know was, well, how can, how can we all use it, right? Um, and we were very lucky that early on in 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 the in creation of this kit that uh some people started to experiment with it at the species level um to you know really helpful for us because we were focused at, at higher taxonomic levels and in fact the first paper to apply it was a really nice paper from bruce murphy um who studied the pitcher plant the carnivorous plant genus nepenthes um, pro producing a remarkable, um, really the first really comprehensive, well-supported tree of life uh, for those opening up all sorts of opportunities to unpick the biogeography and the evolution of that amazing group. Um, then my colleague Isabel Laradon decided to tackle some really intractable groups, um, an intractable group in the Sedge family, one which has never been resolvable with conventional methods. Um, so looking at the, the, the C4 um, Cyprus radiation, which, yeah, as you can see here, she actually managed to, um, to, 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 to resolve in quite a, a comprehensive way. We're now seeing proof of concept studies demonstrating the value of the um, uh, uh, data using 353 for population genomic studies. Um, so it does seem if you manipulate it in the appropriate you handle the data in the appropriate way it does seem to have ticked that um almost unachievable box of operating across taxonomic scales now you can imagine though that we launched this kit and there's lots and lots of interest in it and people start using it but for those people who had say only just gone through the massive investment of designing their their own unique probes for their target group this was a this was a i guess a, a bit disheartening in a in a, in a way um, but it's important to distinguish between universal kits and bespoke um, custom pro kits which may be designed with a particular science question in mind targeting particular genes that have functions that are relevant to the things you're interested in um, the approach that i particularly appreciate is the one taken here by uh this this team led by eskio ogutsen who designed a bespoke kit for their, their favorite family, the African violet streptocarpus family, Gesneriaceae. Um, and they not only identified a set of genes that interested them, but they also built in um, Gesneriaceae orthologs for the 353 genes, which automatically makes any data that they generate and make public integratable uh, with, with our work or with anybody else working with the with, uh, with 353 data. Um, and we <clears throat> even subsequently discovered that it was possible to, if you already had ordered your custom probes, you could still probe both for, you could still enrich both for your custom genes and for the 353 genes by simply making a cocktail and using that in the, in the enrichment step. It seems so simple um, to be telling you that now, but at the time, just a few years ago, that seemed like something that probably wouldn't work but it it, it it totally does provided you just get the stoichiometry of the of, of the of the of the of the probe cocktail correct so all of this is quite a relief because there was at the time uh, a lot of toing and froing about you know the, the the pros and cons of a universal probe set versus custom probes and I don't think intellectually that's a particularly interesting thing to get stuck into so knowing that all options are on the table really just puts puts an end to that debate uh okay so as i said these tools have been taken up quite widely um we published um a, a large number of 20 or more papers in parallel special issues of the journals of the botanical society of america american journal of botany and applications in plant science that apps is more focused as you might imagine on methods um so there's review pieces and empirical case studies um, in there, which if you want to know more about all of this, then you, you, you'll enjoy digging in there. 
So I've already shown you that we've gone along, we've dug a long way into the angiosperms. How did we go about doing that? Because right at the beginning, when we still had, you know, 13 and a half thousand genera to do, it was pretty daunting. Uh, the team, I and mean, this, this, the agenda for this really came from within the team. They were adamant that we had to involve everybody early on, and they were quite right. Um, so actually, the first thing we did was put out a call to all my colleagues at Q. Who wants to come and play? Who who will help us pull together samples for for their favorite families? We effectively were or were offering asking people, you you come to us with 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 material. We'll generate the data and we'll work with you to write up um, worthwhile research outputs from there. And we quickly built up a whole list of expressions of interest, and that soon bled out of queue, and it became a kind of um, an, a, a living international organism of its of its own, such that we now have nearly 300 people involved across 117 institutions in, in 21 countries, and, and these are not the most up-to-date figures. Um, and one of our, you know, partners we cherish most of all is the Genomics for Australian Plants um, uh, a, a, a consortium, consortium all the um, Australian um, plant science organizations who have come together to develop genomic resources and use them for research on the Aussie flora. And they wanted to build an Australian tree of life. They wanted to sample all the genera. And it was hugely heartening to us that they committed as a, as a national project to using our tools and collaborated with us. We had two-way data sharing and um, all sorts of joint science opportunities that are still coming to, to fruition. And the kinds of things that have come out of this project, I mean, just to give you a sense of the sort of research, they're really sort of hardcore um, rebooting of, 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 of big picture phylogenetic systematics, people going back to the back to basics and, and with data sets of, you know, there's a multiple orders of magnitude bigger than the preceding data sets, kicking the tires on, on, on everything that we think we know about the relationships among plants. Uh, tending to do it in a family or an order level um, unit. So, for example, this is a lovely paper on the order Mertales, a really, really important order of um, several families, including um, the eucalyptus family. That's the rainbow bark eucalyptus on the on the right there. Incredibly important plant group um, uh, in, in Australia, of course, and many other genera across the tropics. They really contribute substantially to rainforest composition and it's fundamentally important that we understand their relationship so that we can ask meaningful questions about them um slightly more glamorously the orchids um have also been the focus of of uh, of, of a major push here this is a preliminary paper that came out in that special issue there's another one in review at the moment with a much larger sampling this one revealing deep reticulation in 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 the early history of um, of orchid evolution, it's very important to 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 appreciate that that is something that's in, impacting our picture of the tree of life. So, where have we got to? Well, um, phase one uh, was six years, supposed to be five years. We overran a little bit, ended in March last year, and by the end of that. Um, that time we had sequenced nearly 60% of the genera. We generated data for 60% of the genera, I should say. We ourselves had 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 sequenced six, um, six and a half thousand of those. Um, the Australian project considered uh, contributed um, around 750. We had also mined extensively from public data, leaning massively on the, you know, for example, on the European Nucleotide Archive. Um, and uh, yeah, making sure that we were choosing carefully and and getting the, the best possible um, best quality data out of there using various approaches to to um, to verify identity and so on. Now we're in phase two. Um, to uh, uh, my great delight, we were funded again by by the philanthropists who have supported phase one, and we have another four years basically to finish the job. Um, starting in April last year. Um, so we have five and a half thousand, five thousand six hundred genera to sequence to reach 100%. And how are we going about that? 
Well, we continue to collaborate widely, um, but our priority right now is really to mine everything we possibly can from the Q herbarium. This is just a shot of an active uh, day in, 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 in one of the wings of the Q herbarium. And so our team is uh, running around this building, um, trying to locate the best possible samples, most accurately identified um, material that looks most likely to yield good, good results. Um, and we're extracting DNA like crazy. Um, we've we procured um, major uh, sequencing services. In fact, compared to the previous phase, we'll be outsourcing a lot of the a lot of the molecular biology. Um, yeah, so we are on the verge of, of starting a major splurge of of of, of uh, data generation right now. Um, we have about uh, two thousand um, DNAs already secured, but one thing we're noticing already is that we are going to have to, the Q herbarium will not yield everything we need. Um, and we're already building links and seeking help from our friends and partners around the world to 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 ensure that we can source material of, of everything. Um, I want to, so the most of the last part of the talk is about um, how we've been making um, our, uh, our data available. Um, let me just minimize that so you can see better. Um, so we, as I said at the beginning, we have always had an agenda to 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 ensure that our our, our work is openly available. And to that end, we have created a web portal called the Q Tree of Life Explorer. It was launched in July 2020, and we're about to do our our third full data release. And through this rather simple portal, you can explore our tree, you can get to all the data and metadata, you can download whatever you want, sequence data, assemble genes, alignments, gene trees, species trees, it's all there. Um, I'll give you a quick tour through some screenshots. So data release three, which should be live within the next week or two, uh, covers almost all families. It covers 8,300 genera, 10,000 species some one and a half billion base pairs. And it really is an unprecedented open data resource for plant phylogenomics. Um, this is just a screenshot of the species browser that allows you to um, look at all the samples that we've sequenced in a, in a systematic context. You can um, dig deep to get more, more data and in the sidebar. Um, in some instances where the data exists, you can click through to see an image of the actual specimen um, from which um, DNA was uh, uh, was extracted and sequenced. Um, you can then click through to find the position of that plant in the tree. You can see the blue line uh, showing the, the, showing the connection to the base. Uh, you can see where that Afrophotonia is. It's highlighted in blue, blue text in the middle. Um, if you want to dig into the in, into all the raw data, you just follow the access FTP link at the top, and that takes you to um, a whole whole all, all the data. It's all there. Um, it's important to emphasize that there are many many taxa in this tree that have never been sequenced before. In fact, this thing to going to fight on this is a whole new family that was discovered partly as a result of data generated through um, through through this project. Um, so, uh, yeah, some really novel things um, that we're making publicly available there. Um, yeah, it's just the kind of thing you can get out of the FTP if you dig in. So if you want to know more about um, that, we published um, a marker paper in systematic biology in 2022. Um, it's full of information about the whole open tool package that we created at the probes our lab protocols, our analysis pipeline, and the data portal, and, and, and directs you to, to, to all of the data. So please, please go and dig in. And just to wrap up, I'll touch on just a couple of the, the, the science things that are now flowing forth from all of this. Um, we have a major paper um, in, in, in progress that involves all of that collaborative network as co-authors, known as, as our big tree paper, um, which pulls together everything that we have sequenced to date and uses it to, uh, it, it gives an unprecedented structure through which to explore um, the diversification dynamics of the, um, 
uh, of the flowering plants. The tree on the right shows kind of, um, for those of you in the know, those are uh, the colored bars represent a kind of a heat map versions of lineage through time plots. So the colors rep represent the speed of diversification, the rate of of lineage accumul accumulation over time, the time scales on the bottom. And you can see the broad bar at the top shows how angiosperms <clears throat> display this rapid early burst of diversification um, that is not unconnected to um, Darwin's big idea of the abominable mystery of the, the origin of, 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 of many of the angiosperms. But you can see how if you break that down and look at the diversification dynamics, on an order by order basis, that it is in fact underpinned by an entire patchwork of, of, uh, of, of, of highly differentiated stories for each lineage. So we'll be writing that up in full and submitting that soon. Um, we're also revisiting classification. Um, the image there shows the core of the angiosperm phylogeny group. We had a summit here in Q in the autumn um, and are working now on integrating this enormous new nuclear data um, resource into, into the angiosperm phylogeny group classification, which so far has been informed primarily by evidence from the much, much smaller plastid genome. And you know, to he huge delight, many colleagues are starting quite independently to utilize the data for um, really interesting applied uses. So um, my colleagues uh, Elvira Gutierrez and Laura uh, Kelly are um, using trees of life generated for the um, the UK garden flora to explore the evolutionary structure of susceptibility to the emerald ash borer, this very beautiful beetle on the on the left, which is going to become a terrible pest of woody plants in the UK. On the right, you see the Madagascar periwinkle, a famous plant from which important leukemia drugs um, are derived. Uh, my colleague, uh, Melanie Jane Howes and her colleagues are, are building on Pathol's data to, to build an AI informed tree of life approach to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to mine for medicinal molecules, but to pinpoint particular groups of plant which should be uh, explored in detail for uh, alkaloids in particular. And in the middle, you see a project example from a project that I run um, where I'm working with IKEA um, to develop novel authentication tools for um, rattan. Rattan is a spiny climbing palm. It's um, a really important traded uh, forest product that comes from the wild. And the problem is that we can't identify the species of rattan in that chair because all its diagnostic features have been removed. So they have a business risk that they need to understand better are we trading in threatened uh, rattan is the big question. Um, and we have devised methods of, of uh, sequencing directly from rattan furniture like that one. We have indeed sequenced that chair. Um, and we've also built uh, uh, an unrivaled reference data set from our own herbarium specimen that can be used to, to challenge the, the test data. So where are we going next? Well, you know, it's probably pretty obvious to you what my job and description is for the next few years. I've got to finish this task. We've got to sequence all the genera. Um, but alongside that, we are planning new developments to the Future of Life Explorer. Um, we also uh, intend to improve and unpick um, the characteristics of the probe set in more detail. And we want to get on with more science. I and mean, what that science is just yet is, is not scoped, but I think there are huge numbers of opportunities. In terms of what all this means for the future, um, well, being realistic, I think the future for uh, somebody like me working in an organization like this is that we will, in, in the not too distant future, be simply sequencing whole genomes from our biological collections, you know, and that will be contingent on when technology and um, providers start to drive the, the costs down. And one thing, for example, that is often talked about here is how we really should be sequencing all our type specimens. These are the specimens on which individual names are based. Um, so by sequencing the types in particular, you end up with, with especially valuable data. 
I see the role of angiosperms 353 remaining to be central and important as a standard gene set um, for data integration there. There is building up an enormous collection and there will, will be in the future a huge legacy collection of uh, 353 data. I rather hope, though, that the technical processes of targeted sequence capture in the lab um, will be uh, will be something we can abandon once we can simply um, sequence uh, deeply um, deeply enough from our collections to be able to recover the, the author logs without target enrichment. And that just uh, just uh, uh, leads me to to give some very simple acknowledgements, which are in particular to the Paftol team past and present to uh, um, amazing folks to work with. Um, and also to thank the incredible collaborator network who have really helped to make this so successful and to acknowledge our funders, the Khalifa Foundation. And I shall stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks very much for, for the wonderful uh, webinar and for giving us uh, an overview of Plant Tree of Life project and its applications and also showing us uh, some of the future directions it's going to take. Uh, and I would also like to thank all the attendees who joined us today for the webinar. And we also have a few questions in the Q&A box. Okay, so uh, the first question is, how access and benefit sharing rules are addressed in these very large sequencing projects? Is there a specific plan or actions to yeah. ensure that knowledge will be accessible to all? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. Um, and, you know, Q, Q is deeply engaged in, in access and benefit sharing, and we, 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 have, we have staff who advise us on this. In terms of, you know, uh, hard-nosed details of the Nagoya Protocol, we, we uh, are not sequencing samples that would set us outside the bounds of the Nagoya Protocol. We also have a long-standing, um, yeah, we take this stuff extremely seriously. Um, and uh, nothing that comes into queue, you know, as far as we can monitor it closely enough, uh, is anything but but legally sourced. It's, we've been right at the vanguard of, of um, being engaged in the Biodiversity Convention from the very beginning. Um, I suppose one way that we proactively ensure that um, we're we're giving everybody opportunity is by our open data approach. Um, so everything that we generate is 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 public. Nothing ends up you know, within twelve months as our as our aspiration. Um, within twelve months of data generation, our data should be publicly available. Um, and I think that's a key contribution that we give to. Um, give give to the community at large. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is: Do you have any plans to sequence the plant Korima album? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that is. That's a specific question. If it is. <laughs> it is Portuguese crawberry, according to my Google search. Portuguese crawberry. Thank you very much. I I we either have already. Or we will, will be. I can't guarantee we're we're sequencing that that exact species, um, but the genus will be covered. Um, certainly, if it's from Portugal, we'll be able to get a hold of it. Um, and if you haven't looked, please go to the Q Tree of Life Explorer and see if you can find it. Okay. Uh, next question is: Are you also doing whole genome sequencing, or just? oligo-based sequencing to study the phylogenomes. And the next question is, does your group covers the aspects of functional genomics? Um, so no, we're only doing target sequence capture. Um, this is like, it's it's a, yeah, I mean, and I'm not apologetic about that, I suppose. Gosh, I'm sounding defensive. I don't mean to be defensive. Um, it's, uh, we have opted for that approach because it fits to what we can afford and the scale at which we can operate. Um, there is another project that is not dissimilar to, um, to, 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 to our project, which is extremely interesting. Not, not so much the data is visible yet, um, but uh, in, in Singapore, 
um, there is a short read approach on on uh, um, on their flora, um, drawing both on plants that they're collecting from the wild, but also um, from from their herbaria. And I, you know, I see that as quite an appealing direction of travel um, for 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 us. Um, in terms of whole genome sequencing, it, we will still we will always be constrained to to short read sequencing because the kinds of DNA that we can get out of a herbarium specimen is so so degraded. Um, so yeah, we we were unless we're able to complement um, the species that we can sequence, say with things that we have living in our in our in our gardens here, um, depending on what the questioner means by whole genome sequencing. Uh, you know, the future for us is probably constrained to 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 to, to short read approaches. What was the second question? Second was, uh, does your group cover the aspect of functional genomics? Uh, not so much, but um, one area that I I'm anxious to see us pursue, and it's really only been capacity capacity that's limited us, is to get a a clearer understanding of the functions of the three five three genes and understand, particularly in the phylo context, how those functions may, may present certain biases in the context of what we're doing. Um, we understand that they're likely to be predominantly housekeeping genes, many with functions within the plastid, and uh, those may well mean that it skews the picture slightly, and I would like us to dig into that. Okay, thank you. Can you reuse data generated from whole genome sequencing projects already available for other plants? What criteria are you using to select the species to target? Yeah, yeah we have been doing that extensively. Um, I mean, effectively, we've been mining them. Uh, yeah, in terms of selecting, very often you don't have a choice, obviously for rice or soy or whatever, you have a choice. Um, but for most things, there is one record and you take what you get. Um, and we have been adding adding the uh, whole genomes where they add a genus to our to our list. Um, we have we have, however, not been taking them entirely on trust. So we um, for all of our samples, in fact, we we have um, a verification pipeline. Um, to 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 try to kick the tires on the accuracy of the identification at least at the family level. So we have um, we try to recover plastid data from our own data from any 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 other data that we mine, uh, and then in a kind of barcoding environment um, challenge any plastid data that we derive from 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 those data to to confirm the identity of those. Uh, it's a fact, yeah, those, those specimens. Our validation pipeline is all spelt out in our marker paper if you're interested in, in reading more about how we do that. Thank you. Is there any list to check which plant genomes are sequenced or being sequenced or are in priority list? Where we can access and <laughs> download the list? Every, everything that's public is on the, on the Q-Tree of Life Explorer and it's all downloadable. So everything we've done is out there. We don't currently make what we're working on public. I mean, you can, you can, uh, we probably should make our wish list um, public, see if people are, are ready to help us. Um, you would have to, you, you know what we haven't sequenced by what's not on the list. Um, yeah, so go and go and look, go and look at the Explorer, um, Q Tree of Life Explorer, and just Google that, you'll find it. Okay. I'll make sure to include that link uh, in my email you. that I sent. To, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, what about the pipeline used for analyzing those data? Actually, I experienced difficulties in installing the pipelines used to analyze three five three data. How um, can I get some help? Thank <laughs> you for this interesting talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, I uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. Um, I mean, I'm not a bioinformatician. This is part of the embarrassment of leading a project like this when many other people who are much cleverer than me do the do the data analysis. Um, in terms of what what we're doing at the moment, again, that's all specified in our marker paper. 
for gene recovery, we have our own pipeline. Um, uh, one of our bioinformaticians also devised their own assembler um, for 353, um, kind of an overlap assembler, but we're also exploring the, the, the widely used high piper, um, which uh, tends to be the, the toolkit of use. It's recently been rebuilt into a, a and, and containerized and made made more accessible uh, into a high piper version two that's led by by matt matt johnson um yeah the the details of exactly what what uh you know exact protocols again go and look at go and look at our marker paper and you can you're welcome to get in touch with me with my email address on the on the, on the slides um if you if you want me to connect you to any of our bioinformaticians in terms of the tree building, I didn't say anything about that, but it's again using what you might call industry standard approaches, um, using astral to 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 reconcile gene trees, so trees built from each individual tree in a pseudo coalescent framework. Thanks. We can take this one last question. It's it's already one hour. Uh, so does Q have any? technology transfer and education outreach activities, especially to botanical institutions and taxonomists from the global south that houses much of this plant diversity. Yes, yeah, extensively. Um, so, I mean, we have a huge graduate program. We have we host lots of PhD students. We have master's courses, including master's courses with some where we have funding, some grants to support participants from the global south. We run um, uh, tropical plant family identification courses, which again, sometimes have funding to bring people from all over the world. We also run a really nice course, uh, we call our Schroeder course, um, which uh, is a sort of dual remote learning followed up by a, a uh, um, in-country phase where Q staff go out and, and um, train in country. Um, of course, that is scaled. There's only so many of those we can do, but um, you know we have a lot of a lot of um, mechanisms. And I, again, you can contact me via my email, and I can put you in touch with our with our education team. Thanks. 